So it's been over eight years now since I started hormone therapy. Many of you often ask, like, what is the timeline of physical changes, psychological changes on hormone therapy? What might that timeline look like? So why don't we jump into that today? First off, know that this is informed by my experiences as a trans woman taking a relatively typical approach to feminizing hormone therapy. Before I dive into my personal timeline of what I experienced and when I experienced it in terms of changes, let's take a look at general timelines. Again, let's see like what does the research say? What do the guidelines, so to speak, say? And of course, as with a lot of things in transition and a lot of other things in life in general, your mileage may vary. These timelines are a rough estimate of kind of the windows where you might expect changes, but you know, some changes may happen earlier, later, for longer um, than what these kind of averages represent. And you know, these are taken from the WPATH World Professional Association of Transgender Health Standards of Care version seven and eight. You know, this timeline remained the same in the recent 2022 version eight that came out. Also from the Endocrine Society guidelines for hormone therapy. Here's a picture I'll put up here of, you know, kind of what this table of timeline changes looks like, but I'll kind of go through it rather than just plop it up here and then we can sit in silence together for five minutes, as fun as that sounds. There's a lot here and I'm not gonna, you know, break down every single line on this table, but, you know, kind of talking more about some of the bigger picture pieces here that may stick out. As you can see from this table, like a lot of the changes here will start within the first three to six months of taking, you know, hormone therapy regularly. And these are based off of like a more standardized dosing. Generally, a lot of these changes will kind of be maximized by two to three years, just meaning like, you know, after that two to three year point, a lot of these changes, if you're on hormones for another three years after that, you're not going to see most likely a lot more changes. But you know, some things like fat redistribution, breast growth, hair growth, those may continue to occur at the three, four, five, and maybe even beyond um, your markers. So it's important to again note that this is just like an average estimated range. And again, want to emphasize this is based off of like standard hormone therapy doses as put out by like WPATH and the Endocrine Society guidelines. And I say this because the research is very limited for trans and non-binary people who use hormone doses and regimens that fall outside of this like standard purview, like this standardized approach that's often, you know, geared towards like full feminization or full masculinization, like transitioning from one binary gender to another. You know, some of these non-standard kind of approaches may be things like microdosing, as it's sometimes called, or low-dose hormone therapy, reduced or increased frequency of administering hormones, maybe even getting hormone therapy from other sources, like a herbal source for estrogen. The idea that only binary trans people use hormones, that's also false and important to emphasize. You know, more and more non-binary people are discussing experiences with hormone therapy, or at the very least discussing the desire to use hormone therapy, but maybe not seeing all the possibilities because maybe wanting control over more nuanced, more subtle changes. And people who, you know, identify as trans men, trans women, or non-binary may choose an approach that falls outside of that standard purview, depending on, you know, what your unique transition goals are. But we you know, for better and for worse, we don't always have a lot of control over what changes do and don't happen and to what extent when we're on hormone therapy. This is kind of this idea of like a non-standard approach to hormone therapy is something I do want to kind of touch on more in future videos because this was a large part of my dissertation research, exploring the experiences of trans and non-binary people who use non-traditional approaches and regimens and doses for hormone therapy and kind of the reasons why. You know, because this is a phenomenon that we know exists, 
but it is basically non-existent in the research world. And because it's non-existent in the research world, a lot of providers don't give it a lot of importance or credit or attention that it may need. You know, understanding this, among other things, can just help with expanding how we approach and define gender-affirming care. But that's kind of an aside. To give this more of a personal touch, you know, what does my timeline look like? You know, especially as I reflect on it eight years in, because I mean, I'm at that point beyond the time marker of like basically everything on that table where I'm not really getting additional changes. It's more of like a maintenance phase at this point, because given that I've had bottom surgery, if I stopped feminizing hormones, my body wouldn't really be producing much hormones since the, you know, male gonads have been removed. So that is bad for a variety of reasons to not have hormones. So, you know, need to keep taking it as a, at the very least, a maintenance sort of deal, and not so much for inducing additional physical changes. And, you know, as I've mentioned in the past, there's this sort of euphoria that many of us experience simply just by getting prescribed hormones. There's this hope for a better future that was in the palm of my hands. And this coincided with feeling more in sync between my mind, my body, my emotions within those first one to two months on hormone therapy. Kind of that idea of like, this just feels right. And it's sometimes hard to explain, but a lot of trans and non-binary people can kind of connect to this idea of like, we can kind of know within those first few months if hormones are or aren't for us, depending on what we're needing, because those kind of psychological changes do start occurring. Some of it may be a placebo effect, and some of it is changes induced by the hormones, but there's just that, that excitement, that euphoria, that affirmation that helps push against that dysphoria we may have been experiencing. You know, and at this point, couple months in, of course, the physical changes I experienced were very minor, like breast budding, like breasts are just starting to develop. But on a psychological level, again, things were just starting to feel right. Hormone therapy felt right. It's like my internal chemistry was beginning to match what I had known and felt for years. And that's probably an oversimplification of what's going on, but, you know, that's kind of how I envision it. Probably a romanticized way of envisioning it. But anyways, my timeline does fit in many ways with the guidelines at the table I shared. You know, I really noticed a decrease in it's like spontaneous erections two months in, and that continued to go down over time. And it's definitely a case of if you don't use it, you lose it. But what I mean by that is the tissue atrophied over time due to not having those erections and not wanting to really have sex because my sex drive also decreased, but it was low to begin with before hormone therapy, so I certainly wasn't using it. Overall, this was a godsend for my dysphoria to not have that spontaneously occurring anymore. Next, I started really noticing the beginnings of fat redistribution around the two to three month mark as well, and this certainly continued at least for the first two years. You know, some changes in terms of you know, fat redistribution and stomach, of course, breast development, you know, arms, you know, muscle loss, kind of changes in the fat and muscle mass of the body, making, you know, parts of the body more, you know, stereotypically feminine. There were large decreases in muscle mass for sure, not that I was like a bodybuilder or super muscular or strong before, but something I still notice today is that, like, I am way weaker than I was before, and maybe there's a part of me, like, remembering that I was stronger than I actually was, probably. So there's that's definitely a noticeable change. That's still kind of like something that I think about a lot when, you know, I can't lift as much. And in terms of things like hair, I noticed that my body hair was thinning out in about that three to six month range, starting to thin out, you know, growing less, being less thick, you know, more sparse. And, you know, I wasn't very hairy to begin with, but it was definitely a night and day difference for me softer skin, another great change for sure. And I probably didn't really start noticing this until about 6 to 12 months, I would say. Like pretty much all these changes, I greatly appreciate them to this day. Except for maybe not being able to lift as much, but I guess I could work out more to fix that. But yeah. But what about voice? Sadly, no changes there. Um, feminizing hormone therapy does not affect that. It's an important point to reiterate because there's definitely some misconceptions around that. If you do notice changes coinciding with taking hormones, it's probably more likely that 
training of your voice coincided with taking hormone therapy. So we have a correlation here, but correlation, of course, does not mean causation. Just because these sins occurred at the same time does not mean the hormones caused that change. For people taking masculinizing or testosterone therapy, voice changes start to happen pretty quickly. So, you know, it's one of those unfortunate things about feminizing hormone therapy is that there are some changes that we just don't get. Lucky us! As for all the trolls out there who love to say things like, why can't you just accept yourself the way you were born? Well, you know, for that, not that this needs a counter-argument, but gender-affirming hormone therapy is evidence-based, it's medically necessary for many trans people, of course not all trans people, but many. Think of it this way, we don't stop people in other situations from taking life-saving medication or medication that significantly improves their quality of life. So why do we do this for hormone therapy when this improves quality of life and is literally life-saving, like helps prevent suicide, among other things, for many trans and non-binary people? Why do we do this for hormone therapy, kind of get in the way and push back against it? We probably know why. It's, you know, those things like bias, transphobia, even homophobia with people mixing gender identity and sexual orientation and conflating the two, you know, fear of the unknown, fear of people that challenge gender norms or just challenge, you know, what people expect people to conform to. You know, we're escaping that box that society has put us in that makes people uncomfortable. It's also normal to, you know, be kind of questioning and uncomfortable with things that are new and different for you. But it's also important to learn the science and get outside of that confirmation bias and getting stuck in that echo chamber. You may not understand or even like trans people, but your personal opinion does not outweigh the very real positive changes that hormone therapy can and do have for countless trans and non-binary people. And those life-saving quality improvement changes, I think that's important to really hone in on. Like, this is doing some really powerful stuff for a lot of people, and we can't just ignore that, or we shouldn't just ignore that. This video has maybe gotten a little on the longer side, so I'll go ahead and stop there. You know, gave you an overview of what, very briefly, what some timelines might look like on hormone therapy for your more standard doses of feminizing or masculizing hormone therapy. Of course, I talked more about the feminizing piece due to my own experiences. And I think it's important to also mention this video is not meant to be any sort of medical advice. You can use this information for what you will in terms of like this may be helpful in guiding some of your own expectations, hopes, and goals. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and reactions in the comments below. What are your reactions to what I have shared? What does your timeline look like? Or, you know, for those of you later in transition, how has your actual timeline maybe compared to what you expected to happen at the onset? Was it very similar, very different? And for those of you that fall outside of those more standard approaches to hormone therapy, what have your experiences been like? I'd love to hear all of your thoughts and more down in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for watching. If you have not done so already, please be sure to hit that like, subscribe, and share buttons. Tipsy and I love and appreciate all of you. Say hello to Tipsy. Oh, she says hello back. Tipsy and I love you all. Bye for now.